everybody. Uh, we're here at Taller Boricua. I'm happy to, uh, uh, how would I say, to introduce Ricardo Molero, which is one of the, the artists that we're exhibiting, that we're exhibiting at, at the gallery at Taller Boricua. Um, I want to thank him. He did a fantastic job in the installation. Esto es hecho a pulmón, without hardly no money. So, uh, but it is important that we give this space to Ricardo because he's a fantastic painter. Uh, he has technique. He has a technique, and I love what he did with the technique and his landscaping of Manhattan. I wish uh, Gail Brewer came here and saw this. I'm going to send her an email. Uh, she's the Manhattan Borough President. Okay, I'm going to invite her to come over. Uh, so, I want you to talk about you. He's from Caguas. Uh, how long have you been here in the States? Um, hello, Nitsa. Thank you for having me. And um, it's a great honor to be here at Taller as a Puerto Rican artist and an artist-run institution. Um, I've been in the States formally uh, since 1980. I was born in Omaha, Nebraska, because my father went to uh, college medical school in Omaha, and I was the firstborn of five. And uh, then soon after, uh, we left to go back to Puerto Rico. I was about four months old, and since then, I grew up in Puerto Rico. My life was in Puerto Rico with my family. So I see Puerto Rico as my alma mater. And um, so, so that's, uh, so not until I came to college then, I, we all assumed that we would come to college in the States. And uh, so I, so 1980, I landed in uh, Louisiana in the South and uh, studied architecture. Uh, so I have a degree, my first degree, college degree is in architecture. I then uh, drove up, my parents bought me a car, a Volkswagen, and they um, encouraged me to just drive north. Uh, so I ended up in Montclair, New Jersey with some relatives of my mother, uh, the Latimer side of the family, and uh, worked for an architect there and applied to graduate school at Columbia for historic preservation. And uh, that's in 1988, I moved, formally moved to Manhattan to um, pursue my, my master's degree at Columbia University in his historic preservation. So, so, so I want to ask you, living in Puerto Rico, how, it is, since you were a kid, how was it that you got into, into the art? I mean, what moved you to, uh, to, to move into the art and, you know, pursue? a career in, in the arts, in, 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 in starting from Puerto Rico? So, um, you know, I, I had, uh, on my father's side, I had cousins next door. There were eight kids and we were five. So it was never a dull moment. Uh, we, we played volleyball, we played basketball. There was a never a dull moment. Uh, their mother, uh, my uncle's wife, was from San Juan. And uh, she was a great artist, uh, not known, but she was really very talented. And so a couple of my cousins were taking painting classes. Um, at the time, I was a Cub Scout. I was, a, yeah, a Cub Scout. And we were making, you know, crafty stuff with uh, little wood sticks and things like that. Everyone's doing the same thing, and it had to look in a certain way. And we all looked the same with the little uniforms. And I was just getting bored because I wanted to kind of break from that a little bit. And I, um, I begged my parents to put me in a painting class with my cousins. Um, but instead of going there first, we went to the free class in my hometown that um, I can't remember the, the painter, but it was uh, in Caguas, it was run by the city of Caguas, by the government, and it was a, a colonial building with a, a sterile concrete and archways, um, and there was this 
man, short, a little plump, and a hunchback, and cranky. And they, he said, you need a needed eraser, although you're never going to use it. Uh, you need, and then you come here at night at seven, and you come, and I give you. So he, I we went and bought the materials, and then after a while, um, you know, he handed me the first time I remember he handed me um, a drawing of a horse, a really complex one I'll never forget, and it's a little tablet, so I could replicate that, and it was like so difficult. And then he comes around, and he goes, huh. Okay, not bad. And I uh, said, so then he gave me something else. So I guess he wanted to see where I was so he could place me. And that was my first um, class that I actually took of art that I remember. Um, then I moved on to the painter, uh, Don Luis Bosa, uh, who was in Caguas, he's Spanish. And he lived in a real studio, probably the size, smaller than the size of this room, full of paintings. But he showed me different media, and um, different media, and um, you know, pastels and oil, and how to make uh, the tempera. So uh, he would give me out of magazines. Uh, it was not life drawing, but it was more kind of a photograph or other. And he would only take two students at the same time because of the lack of space that he had in his studio. So uh, he was a beautiful painter. Uh, portraits, uh, I just remember going through the studio, which is amazing. He was a real bohemian living mm -hmm. artist that was just full of talent. And I, even to this day, I remember it was such a special moment to be there in his studio. Um, I think he passed away many years ago. He was an older man then, so, um, so I don't, you know, once you leave your town and, you, you know, these connections are sometimes uh, not kept. Yeah. So, so that's, that's uh, how I started painting. Um, but you know, also in Caguas, the Carlos Osorio was from Caguas. He was also a painter. Uh, uh, I know Carlos the name. Osorio, Carlos Osorio, very well known. Uh, he died a few. He was he was one of the mentors here at Taller. But also with uh, in that school, uh, the first one that was run by the government, I think Miguel Paul was also there, uh, the painter from Ponce. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah Miguel Paul, um, and he had many many students. So uh, I was interested because Miguel Paul was more realistic, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He had a lot of sceneries from Puerto Rico, and also landscapes. He did a lot of landscape. That's why I said, you know, maybe, I don't know, this guy looks like a little bit like a hunchback might have been him. Uh, he was very old, white hair, you know what I mean? Yeah. Was, like crunched up like that. Yeah, like, yeah. Viejito. Anyway, so, so you started there and you started doing these paintings when you were young. And then, I don't know, how old were you, like? Uh... Well, I continue that. I was probably about 13 uh, or younger when I first started. Right. And, and then I continued on my own um, as a teenager. And um, I had, then acrylics came into play because, you know, it was the 70s. Yeah. And uh, early 70s, late 70s. and. I remember taking, not knowing how to use acrylics, I still don't, but I explored with them and I painted over all the oils that I had with acrylics yeah. and really butchered the paintings that I had, but you know, it was like, I, it's, I didn't it's, have a- It's two different things, you know, yeah, right? because know. acrylics, they dry very fast. With the oil, you think, this, is this oil or acrylic? This, uh, like, these are all oils, oil. yeah. Yeah, because oil, I mean, I, I, I prefer oil when I paint because you could get those type of things with the light and all of that. I don't think right. you could get that much with, uh, you know, because it, you, you get it into the canvas, into the cloth, you know what I mean? People right. don't know how, to, a lot of people think that you gotta paint and it's gotta have like in pasto, you know, and stuff like that. They don't really know how to work it into the canvas. Right. So. You want to talk about that? Yeah, you know, um, I'll talk a little bit about that. And how I got to that was that I was many years after Puerto Rico. I 
I was uh, teaching interior design at Parsons. I taught there for about five years. And for every class that you teach, uh, you get a free class that you can take. So I enrolled in uh, Margaret Crook, uh, who's a painter, uh, American painter, and uh, she, the focus of her class, and I took it for like four or five years in a row, uh, with a different focus, but you know, just trying to kind of see what it is that I needed to work on. But it was such great training because that's where I really, her focus was more on the Venetian method of painting. So that's really where I, it's almost like a rekindling of, of my passion for painting and a, a new understanding of oil painting with, um, uh, in, in oils and in, a, in this technique that is a Venetian method of painting which consists really uh, in the preparation of uh, the, uh, the surfaces. I do, I don't know in Spanish what it's called, but it's a wood panel and you see this is, these are traditional, very old techniques um, where you take a wood panel or our ancient uh, painters I uh, used to take a wood panel, seal it with gesso mm -hmm. or chalk yeah. with a rabbit skin glue and it was a process in order to, to seal the wood so it wouldn't rot with right. the oils mm -hmm. and, and it, it, would, it just provides a real, um, a, a very luminescent um, surface and you can control uh, the viscosity of your mixture. It was like pancake mix, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's thicker or thinner. And, and you can, um, so you apply very thin layers over the wood. And that I do in batch because, in batches, because then I can do a few panels at the same time mm -hmm. because it's a labor intensive uh, process. It's a little messy. Yeah. But at the end, you know, you apply, you brush on uh, very thin layers if you want it smooth, thicker layer if you want some texture. Um, you know, you have to wait. It, it, it takes the whole gelling process for that is about two hours before you start applying. And so, so it's, I, I mean, the whole process is like cooking, really. And but at the end of the day, you. And then you send that one, the next day you send it and you buff it. And you create this luminescence, luminescent uh, surface that just takes the paint beautifully. And then um, I start, this is on wood. You can do that on linen, but on linen you do, or canvas, you do a thin watered down version of the, in order to seal the canvas or the linen. Mm -hmm. um, I use a clear rabbit skin glue instead. I don't like the white because I like to work with the texture and the color of the raw linen uh, because then it gives me almost like the imprimatura, which is the first layer that you always kind of uh, have on your paintings. After the, the surfaces are prepared, um, then you start with um, the drawing. Sometimes I do um, a cartoon drawing. And these are really traditional, you know, a lot of people don't use that, but a lot of people do know about it. Um, and you do a, a drawing, and then you do a transfer of the drawing. It's almost like a carbon copy, okay. and then you save the cartoon, because in the ancient, you know, in the Renaissance and all that, in that era, the, it was very labor intensive to do the, the transfer. So you could have that paper almost like, if I need another fabric or a robe, mm -hmm. yeah. I have a template for it, so I use it in a different painting. So it was a more efficient way mm -hmm. of, of producing paintings as a business. So, um, so I just, I never really replicate because I, one of the things that I like is to produce a unique piece. Uh, but I do have a lot of, even this one, I have the, for this painting of this, about eight feet behind me, it's eight foot long, I have uh, a cartoon, the full size, and there are other paintings that I have that are larger that also have it. And sometimes a few lines, but it's 
a way to transfer a sketch uh -huh. uh, from the sketchbook into into the the paint. But uh, the whole technique of bringing light into a painting then is the use of the under white paint. And you start applying where the light is. You start applying where the darkest spots are. So you have almost like a high contrast. And you start with the darkest darks and the lighter lights, and then you're halfway there. Um, so um, you start, you, you compose the, you know, I, I rely on, on sketching um, a lot because then I can, I can, some of the paintings are more conceptual, others are more from photograph or a sketch, life sketch. Yeah, so. but it's the, whole, the, it's the whole preparation that you go to just do a painting. This is not, you take a canvas, put it there, and you just throw whatever And throw the it. paint on, no, yeah. Uh, it, because it, 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 when you look at the painting, you look at the preparation, and you can see the quality uh, versus quick, rather than having preparation and doing something that is well made and very well thought out. Uh, these things are very important for artists or young people that are coming up to start doing this type of work. You know what I mean? The time that you take and what it takes you and then it also, in that process, what goes through your head also, what goes through your head. Lisa, um, I think it's, I, you know, technology is something that has always been there. And other people have used it. You know, Vermeer used apparently the mirrors and other things. So um, a newer generation is using technology in different ways. For me, what gets me excited is to, in such a world of digital art, which is, I think is great, is using what we have now in order to create. So that's always happened. But for me to go back to a more tangible, maybe I'm just old fashioned that way, but um, there's something about being an, you become an artisan. And it's something about the tactility of it, uh, that, um, that you see the hand quality of something that is literally handmade that you don't get in other medium. And so I, that's, that I like because we still see uh, our brush strokes. We still see, it's our signature. Exactly. And uh, every painter will stroke that brush in a different way, right. like your handwriting. Right. And it becomes your, your fingerprint on, on your work. And I get excited about that. I right. get really excited about that. So I, um, so that's what I. And the other thing is that the the whole um, Venetian method is more indirect painting than direct painting. Then direct painting is when you apply, a, you know, you mix, and then it's, the indirect painting is when you begin to to layer. And you have to understand by doing it, you start understanding the, the, what the layer is, trying to anticipate what the layering of certain colors will do for you. Uh, but, but not be so married to that. You know, I have an organized process, but I also allow myself to make mistakes um, or, or deviate from that. But what? Uh, but my process is organized. But then I can get lost within that. Right. Uh, and you can change also. Yeah, you because can change. Because I could, I could imagine that coming up with the things of doing this landscape in the theory and applying that technique. You know. Right. You know, that's something that it was a process for you to, to really, you know, get into it. Right. You know. Yeah. Also, there's. The other thing is a continu it's continuous evolution. It's a dynamic process. I don't feel that I, I have it, or I don't feel that I, 
I, I've conquered anything. I feel that the more I paint, the more I discover. So it's a constant discovery. And I just want to paint more because, you know, I remember um, the first time I took the class, I, I was afraid to put paint on it. I kept doing washes. And Margaret Crook, uh, the instructor and painter, she said, oh, that's very nice. But, you know, maybe it's time to put some paint on that because it is a painting class. And I'm like, oh, okay. The next day, I transported all the stuff. I had my uh, paint thinner jar, and I get to the class, and it's like spilled all over in the bag, and, and my painting had all of these um, smeared colors, and I'm like, oh my God, this is tragic. It's a mistake. It's a, a real, you know, boo-boo, um, and I'm like, and then Margaret's like, oh, it's okay. It'll be fine. And in part is because the, the, the additional layering that you have to correct to make, when you make a mistake or when you make a change, let's say, um, a lot of things that we perceive as mistakes may be an opportunity to discover something new. Yeah. And then you go like, huh. So you have to be flexible about, about how you travel through your painting. In every painting, like I know, I think I know something about every single painting or a few things about a moment of discovery or mm -hmm. something. They, they become almost like a map. And uh, so. Very, very important the things that you're, you're talking about, well, which is your process as an artist and your technique and all of those things and the fact that this is. Uh, you should. You will continue painting and discovering new things and changing within the medium and the the, the themes and stuff like that. Uh, it's a whole life process uh, as an artist. You know, I I've always painted in. I started in the early '90s. I was. I start. I I'm packing up the apartment to make a move, and I'm going through all of the organizing my papers, and I'm seeing in brown paper, these loose sketches of water towers from 1991, from, no, before that, 1990, 1980, 88. And, um, you know, you, you evolve a lot, but yet you, I, I like to work in series, because when, and you can work on multiple series, and I, but it, it kind of marks what you're being influenced by at the moment, and it allows you to, okay, so today I'm doing water towers. Tomorrow I may be uh, really, what resonates with me is uh, the water, or the river, or, or, or the, the beach, or, or people, you know, or something, or the color black, or I'm discovering, that's the other thing, I discover colors. I discover just because you know you keep discovering things every time. I'm like somebody recommends, um, somebody recommends paints gray, and I'm like, oh, paints gray. Oh, what is that? Gray. What was that that you said? And I say, and then oh, paints gray, and I said, oh, okay. So, and I'm like, oh my god, this color is so elegant, and so it could be, and it's not black, it's not, it's kind of blue, and it varies depending on the. So you start. This is where I find also my sketchbooks are useful because um, I find that my sketchbooks is an opportunity for me to test things. Like, oh, I don't know anything about this color, so it allows me, and I, it's, like a, I go, it's like a journal, because I go back, I, have, I brought some in my bag so to look at, but I, for me it's almost like a journal, because it's also a, a, an annotation, whether it's in color, whether it's a drawing, whether it's a moment, is that I can go back and I remember, I drew, I'm like, okay, that's what that was all about. I annotate it, I date it, uh -huh. because uh -huh. it's, um, it's a discipline, really. Right. Um, and, and, but I rely on, it's my note-taking for painting. Um, 
uh, I know that it's different for everybody, but it works for me. Right. So, um, and I do a lot of, um, because of the method of uh, layering thin layers of color, I tend to not mix, uh, pre-mix a lot of color, uh, like uh, except for when I'm trying to make a pink or something like that, then I mix some. But a lot of my, um, well, I do a lot of optical mixture. For instance, I do a layer of yellow, let it dry, so that's why the paintings take a long time also. Mm -hmm. And then I do a layer, a thin layer of blue, and then I get green. I don't do mixing green and apply green, because I find that, that because of the way I prepare, it gives you the same color here is going to take differently than over here. Right. Bec and then, so, but it makes, it provides a depth that is just... Transparency, and it's just the transparency. The transparency, yeah. but also the, the fact that I prepared the, the panel my own way, I never know. It's always a surprise how the paint is going to take. Mm -hmm. uh, there's something spontaneous about it that I like. Uh, something unpredictable, which is, makes it exciting because uh, it's like a like a like a mark on your hand or something that you don't know when you when you have uh, um, ink or something on your hand and it, it goes in between the the grooves of your skin um, and then you you know it's harder to get out but the same thing happens over mm -hmm. here so I'm almost like humanizing these paintings but they they are portraits well they are they well um, they're painted but they're human because they have their own personality yeah and. Uh, and everybody takes them in differently, you know what I mean, depending on people's experience. But these are really great. Your drawings also, uh, the drawings that you hung up on the wall, uh, which are the sketches, Yeah. Uh, those are really very beautiful. Thank you. Too, you know, it's like uh, in itself they're, they're a work of art, uh, something that you thought out and they're perfect. <laughs> You know, they're not meant to be perfect, but yeah, well, well, I mean, but it's you know an idea. I mean, yeah, I know, but it's a, it's an idea, and I have, I have tons of them. Some of them are crooked, and some of them, but, um, but I, um, for me, it's important. I, I feel that I needed to communicate, uh, take this as an opportunity to communicate that it's not just about the end product, that there is a whole process from that, and a lot of my paintings start with. A sketch that big. Uh, these are the larger ones, but uh, some of times uh, the, I have a painting here called Moonlight that is a four inch by four inch painting. The sketch is probably like five by five, <laughs> so you never know how that's going to transfer to, you know, in that case it's a one case that I think I have a painting that is smaller than the get sketch, but I, I think I sometimes, and I sometimes you see that there's a grid to transfer the sketch onto a larger format, uh, so I can size it, I can order the panel, but also there's sometimes a sketch has a certain looseness that you don't want to lose, um, or you don't, you know, you want to re retain, and uh, the grid helps me to kind of replicate the, the a certain curve or, or something that I or some shape that I want to retain in order not to lose uh, the spontaneous quality of a sketch. Uh, so, um, so it's um, I sometimes uh, the sketches are tiny, and I have to kind of look with you know uh, with a loop just to get the right line and, and kind of draw it on a larger scale. Uh, so I did one that it was called Atlantico. It was a triptych. It was like about eight feet in length. And um, I remember doing the lines just like the sketch, and that's the first time that I did a transfer from a sketch directly in order to retain that spontaneous uh, dynamic. And the sketches are dynamic, tend yeah. to be yeah. dynamic to me. Yeah, they're beautiful. Well, anyway, um, anything else uh, you want to say before we open it up to the public? Uh, so that they can ask you questions. Um, one thing that I do want to say is that uh, 
I think what we're doing today is really important. I'm really excited because I think it's really important to, in the artist community also, artistic community to share information. I'm a believer that, um, that we grow from talking to each other. And that's one thing that I totally agree with. And, and I, I'm excited to be here because of that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We're glad we have you here. This is a magnificent show. Thank so, you. Thank uh, you for having be, me. It will be aired in our website and probably go to YouTube and stuff like that. And we will try to photograph some of the pieces also so that we can have it so that people can see what we're talking about. So opening it up to the public who wants to ask any questions from the public. Do you that's a well, 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 I, I use oh, this. Yeah. It's so it's easier that one is easier. <laughs> Thank you. Pass the baton. <laughs> uh, when you start out, do you have anything specific that you want to say about what it is you're painting? Yes. Okay, in this case, you're doing architecture. What, do you, what is it you want to say about that? Um, I don't know whether it's about the architecture per se, or it's about a certain feeling. I, in regards to the rooftops, I think I'm kind of attracted to, maybe I'm dyslexic or something like that because I need to, in my, and I'm a visual person, so for me it's about organizing things and distilling some of it in order to be able to comprehend. And when I do a painting, I like to kind of create more of a focal point about what the message or, or what I'm trying to convey with the painting. Uh, it may be about the light. It may be in this painting here, looking down from El Rufo, um, is I did this from memory because I used to go to an apartment on 86th Street and I would look down and it would be, uh, it's a flyover really, like, uh, like you do on an airplane in the fields of the Midwest or something and you see the farmland all divided. But it's, it's really the patios and stuff, but I, this one was more about the color and the geometry per se that is inferred. But I also wanted people not to see it right away. I don't want to, I didn't want to, people to, I wanted people to kind of have like an aha moment and kind of like discover what it is and then kind of feel like they're about to fall in. Uh, so it's, it's, this one is about that. Uh, Rainy Night, which is a chromatic black um, with a little light on, was from a sketch. I wanted to convey that the imprimatura, which is the initial layer, is very thinned out and it has dripping. So I wanted to convey not only that it was night, but I wanted to convey that it was a monsoon at night. And for me, it was important to uh, really communicate the runniness of the water and the rain and how wet it was. So, um, so yes, it's uh, it, it, it's about that. It was also about about at that moment I was thinking I should do a black series. But I don't really use black in my paintings. I mix and I do a chromatic black, or I do a chromatic gray. I hardly ever use black. I have used black, but I'd like to create my blacks out of the three primary colors, or a variation of the three primary colors, because I think it's more interesting. Uh, so, um, but I do want people to feel something, and to me that's important, because that's, I don't expect that everyone's gonna like what I do. I don't come in, uh, thinking that way because then you're thinking about it in the wrong way. Uh, you, you, I want people to maybe feel something when they see it. I remember Man in the Box is one that is on my website and I think it was about my fear of confinement. Confinement, physical confinement and psychological confinement. And it's a very, psycho I, somebody said it was a very psychological painting. 
and it is. But the figure is not perfect, but it's about communicating the discomfort. And um, so that, that painting, you know, either you like it or you don't. A lot of people say, you know, that's freaky, mm -hmm. right? And, and somebody said, oh, it's like, peace, it's beautiful. And I'm like, okay, so I love listening to, but yeah. that's the other thing. It's like, I don't, I never, I do it thinking about something. And one of the things that I discover is that I love what people bring because that's the other half of the painting is the viewer. And the viewer is what completes, I think, a piece of art. And it's completed every time that somebody else looks at it. Because you'll have, you'll feel something uh, different. You, you'll bring something different. You'll bring your own life experiences into the piece. Mm -hmm. So that piece is going to be different every time for each person. You're, you're translating feelings into visuals. Yeah. That's, yeah, I guess. Yeah. That's the dynamics with the colors and the bright, the, the brightness of it or the dark. Uh, that's what you're trying to do so that the person gets moved. That's, that's what it goes with his paintings. Mm -hmm. So I like to say that the one that was speaking was Jorge Malave. He's a photographer and a printmaker. He's a very well known photographer. So anybody else wants to? The first thing I want to say is that um, you're a curator's dream come true, in which you not only you, you sit there and you, you've taken me on a journey of your experience, your creative experience, and I actually am so glad to be here. And thank you for the opportunity, because this is, this is important. This is important for us as professionals. It's important for the artists, because that's also your journey, as well as mine. And um, I see so many of the things that you're talking about in your painting. And there's a lot of things that I also have questions about. For instance, I know that you're using architectural drawings as an architectural design of what you want to do, and that you're interpreting that design, architectural design, into a painting that takes it a step further, that translates into you who you are as an artist and me as a viewer, well, I would bring to it something, whatever that may be. When I first came in, you came to me and you said, remember we saw those water towers at a, at a, a it was a fair thing, right? And, and I, I remembered it from the feeling I got from looking at the towers and how you captured it in that painting. I kept going back and saying, oh my God, that's how I felt when I looked at the towers because they were above me and they were connected to me and it's sort of, and that painting, you succeeded in doing that yeah. from your own personal creative manner and style. Congratulations, I, I'm loving this. I wish I had another okay. few days to listen to you. Uh, I would no. do that. Uh, that's Gladys Peña, she's a curator. Uh, she's curated many, many shows, so that's glad as well. And thank you, Tajet, for doing this. I yeah. think it's incredible. Yeah. Well, I, I want to congratulate you for the installation that you did of this exhibition. Mm -hmm. I love, I love that, uh, that you used the, the comparison between uh, the original sketch and the final product. Hardly anybody does that. No artist does that. They don't want to show the, the, what, where they got the, the idea, the process, or anything. And you, I guess, as a teacher, if, whether you're not a teacher or not, that's a, that's a, um, that's a good ploy for, for, for teaching art, you know? Mm -hmm. And that, that runs right parallel with our mission, you know, to, to be a community educational center also, that's just a cultural center. I really think it's important to, for anyone to, for artists or the viewer to understand that this doesn't just happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and 
I like I, I think it's all about the process and because it's who said that it was a journey? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, that it was it's a journey. It's a, and it's a journey. Each painting is a journey. Uh, the whole process is a journey uh, that you can get lost in it, and it's wonderful. Um, I could spend a whole day on something, and and then I come out of that and I'm back, you know, in a different world. So um, I uh, so yeah, I just um, I it, it's almost like a, a a new found me in a certain way to. Every day, like every day, it's an evolution. It's a constant evolution, and I call it evolution because evolution is not just change. Change is short term, evolution is a long journey. And um, I think, um, you know, so. In, in some of your literature, I think you mentioned something about the, about the Hudson School. Yes. Is that part of your. your uh, Conscious. Uh, uh, the Hudson River School of Painting. I, you know, I've been discovering uh, that area, the Hudson Valley, and I have. But you're influenced because it's also used as the same kind of Venetian method. Mm -hmm. But um, what is striking, the the way that it has influenced me is that then. Um, It's not a direct comparison, but it's, um, it's more of a contrast. But it's using, it's recognizing that when the Hudson River School in the 1800s um, came about, there was an, a, a real congested downtown city of New York, smaller city, but congested. And people like Thomas Cole took a trip up the river, and the mid-1800s was a time when people were starting to leave the city. Uh, Central Park was being created. Uh, there was this um, um, view of being outdoors and, and away in the countryside was a healthier mm -hmm. lifestyle. And a lot of cemeteries became parks, and, mm -hmm. and all these things um, happening. Um, and I think it was just before that that uh, Thomas Cole and took that journey up the river and discovered uh, this amazing virgin or you know uh, landscape that was so powerful and that Europeans were not aware that aware of. And he made it so. Um, but then he also alluded at the progress of technology trains and all that and they starting to appear in some of his work so taking all of that and and saying they're still beautiful but the reality is that when I look out my window I see buildings and I see I see a rhythm I it's see a it's a it's a different kind of landscape it's a, it's a modern landscape and it's also the the idea that you know you get HVAC uh, steam cloud is the cooling towers and the ski. that looks like a landscape a traditional landscape but it's not it's steam clouds from a machine in the winter it's, it's man-made it's always the, uh, uh, it's, it's the same technique they were using some of these techniques, right? But the and it's, it's, it's nature in the countryside and all of that, and this is the city which is man-made, kind of like landscape, you know? Right. So so, but it's the technique and it's in a different format or right. whatever. Right. So it's alluding to the same thing, but it's different and more modern. They do have something in common. And it's yeah. light. Right. The light. <laughs> and other natural the dark, kind and of, the yeah. colors. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yes, that's why. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, and and look, it's about. I don't know. It's just a you know, New York can be overwhelming city, but it can also be beautiful. And you know, the way the light hits the buildings, the water towers that have become part of our um, our city. I call it our city because I'm an adopted New Yorker. Mm -hmm. um, 
after a while we all become New Yorkers yeah. and um, so uh, so you know the the idea of the structure the aging structures of New York mm -hmm. the water towers that are still working the same way and uh, so and the rooftops that become this other area that you come it's like this other zone of quiet it could be personal it could be spiritual it could be uh, a lot of things. So, one more additive to that question: Is your uh, technique, oil technique, which is glazing? I believe is yeah, glazing, glazing, right? Yeah. Is that does that also relate to the school of uh, the yes. Hunter yeah. School? Yes, that's what we were saying yeah. earlier. That oh, is a I similar technique, okay. yeah. but then is reinterpreted, not in the landscape but in urban landscape. And so there's the commonality of the technique and uh, using two different landscapes and more of the urban landscape and kind of recognizing the, what is familiar to us, what is surrounding us is a different kind of landscape than the river school of painting right, landscape. Right, Even though it's the most on river, it's Manhattan. Marcos, you. you want to say who you are? Oh yeah, well, thank you. My name is Marcos Dimas. And, um, Executive Director of Taller Boricua, the Puerto Rican yeah. work, Workshop. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. Man. Thank you. For so coming. anybody else has any more uh, questions? You have any questions? Any questions? Um, when you mentioned the uh, Hudson River School, it reminded me that in the 1930s, the WPA artists, the ones that did some small paintings, actually started to use light the way you're using it and how they used it also. And there was a very small group of artists that did that. And some of them actually used um, what they call gesso on board, yeah. which is, I, I'm not sure if it's similar to what you're doing, but you seem to have taken it all a step further. You know, I, I really, I really love what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. congratulations. You know, we all have our little signature of how we move our, our brush drugs. Yes, and no, it's, it's, uh, and the it's about that. everything. And the way you slide in your paintings and abstracts, um, that happened, that started to happen during the WPA. But I never really saw any artist that had done it so successfully yeah. as you oh, have been doing. Exactly. Thank you. Well, so, yeah. yeah, I'm excited about that. Yeah. So, anybody else has any more questions? That's it. I don't have any questions. No, you have any questions for us? Reverse it. Well, you have any questions? Oh and God, you now you put me on the spot. <laughs> um, how does this compare to? I was. You know, I don't know. I just like I. I took it and I did my. What is different? It's, it's, it's just a different everything. Kind of we try to when we pick the show with me and Marco, we pick the show and we pick the artist. We try to bring something different. Yeah. All the time, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, but we is a, a quality. The quality is very important. You know. Uh, you know uh, those things for us and to maintain the gallery at that level, because mm -hmm. we've been around for fifty years, uh, so a lot of people know know us. When and also we piggyback on artists like you and younger, you know what I mean, that are starting out. And what happens is that their careers take off. So El Taller outside uh, in the city is is known is known for doing this type of thing and also bringing other artists uh, so that you know they respect us. In other words, yeah. But it's based is is based as an artist organization done by artists. Right. That's the key. Like I'm the curator. Marcos also curates. My name is Nixa Tufino, with that, which I didn't say before. But and I direct the the Taller RTP uh, printmaking workshop. So and I work with other artists. So that's what we try to do. But it's based on an artist's uh, uh, point right. of view. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Which is different. You know, it's not a, it's not a museum. It's not nothing else. But this is an artist's point of view. Mm -hmm. And uh, your art, your, your work, the quality, that's why it's here. You know what I mean? So every time we do shows, we do, we do it like that. But we've been around for 50 years. 
This whole week lasts another 50. I won't be around, but. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> will carry that torch. Shadows, so we'll see. But uh, those things are very important. So I want to thank you thank for you. your work. I want to thank you for the installation, for your patience uh, doing you know, this. And we will work on the video and let's see what happens through the whole. This is going to be here to October 27. Yes. And then after that, it goes up on our website and stuff like that. So uh, we shall continue. Well, it's been, uh, a, like I said in the beginning, it's been a great honor for me to be invited here because I've been coming to the various openings and um, I just kind of have great respect. And it uh, makes me really proud to be from Puerto Rico, where I am from. Well, we're glad and you're in Puerto Rico and you're doing this. This is fantastic. And, okay. uh, you know, another Puerto Rican in New York, I have to pay my landscapes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, so. yeah. You know, not, not your landscapes from Cagua because you have one for Cagua. I have one from, from Cagua, but I didn't go with this exhibition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, and I want to thank Willy Correa, who is our videographer. Mm -hmm. And he's the one that works the website here, uh, websites and our social media and all of that. And I want to thank Jay Muniz, who is the one that takes care of the galleries and all of that. And oh, he was. Uh, Jay was my right hand here, and, and yeah, uh, we spent a lot of time together and talking and getting to know each other very well. So yeah. Good. Uh, he's a great illustrator. Oh, so yeah, talk about a, like uh, illustrator. talk he's about so, sharing yeah. information. Yeah, he's a great illustrator. Yes, that's right. So anyway, thank you all for coming. I will be closing, and this was thank you.